Good morning and good afternoon if you're in mainland Europe. Welcome to this Memory of Water webinar focused on Govan in Scotland, where Fable Vision is proud to have been the Scottish partner. From 2017, six European cities of Govan, Gdansk, Glavaria, Limerick, Ostend and Stockholm have developed, secured creative European funding for and collaborated on the delivery of an artist-led exploration of what's next for post-industrial waterfront heritage in the context of community development. Activities have been participatory and co-created with local communities, including artist residencies, supporting community activism, discursive <laughs> events engaging planners, architects, politicians, and local residents, shared learning, best practice knowledge exchange, and debating new ways forward together. With an artist's eye view, Memory of Water, that's memoryofwater.eu if you haven't found our website yet, engaged in uncovering alternative approaches to regeneration and citizen-led planning, with questions around bridging the gap between grassroots visioning and implementation, how to avoid gentrification, and whether or not artists are vulnerable to being used for different agendas. The main focus of these Creative Europe-funded endeavours has been strengthening cooperation between artists who are often facing competing agendas in the context of urban planning and community development. As our project draws to a close, today an is an opportunity to reflect on the impact the work of this pan-European six cities exploration has had on the people of Govan. Projects like this help to maintain and strengthen relationships with mainland European partners at a time when Scotland is being taken out of the EU against our will. But what about the impact locally on Govan itself? Has the contribution of artists helped to influence policy, strengthen stakeholder involvement and amplify community voices? Is there evidence of impact on planning decisions and what are the key challenges going forward? Our deliberations today will be facilitated by academic experts from the University of the West of Scotland, Professor Katarzyna Kazmala and Professor Graham Jeffrey. And so to session one, to govern with love. And please feel free to write your questions and feedback in the chat function. So on top of Brexit, Scotland, like everyone else, has had to cope with the global pandemic this year. Fortunately, we had managed to host our initial cultural mapping residency where our artists got to know Govan, its community, its history, its people and its possible futures. So before I hand over to Professor Kosmala, and with thanks to Jonas Mistran, who has documented the whole Memory of Water project on film, Welcome to Govern with Love. So over to you, Professor Kosmala. 
Okay, so could we maybe ask, uh, before I maybe ask Jonas to, to speak a little bit uh, more to us about the challenges on documenting residency virtually uh, in Govan. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am a chair in culture, media and visual arts at the University of the West of Scotland. And I've been appointed an uh, expert in this Memory of Water project, um, linking with uh, doctoral programs which are the key uh, to memory of water uh, residency, one being in Gdansk, Poland, and second being in Govan, uh, Scotland. Uh, since 2012, I've led um, regeneration and water from heritage zones in Yo Northern Europe, uh, International European Network. And out of the research came uh, several uh, practice-based PhD projects, which we have here at the University of the West of Scotland, core to this uh, memory of water, uh, one of which is Liz Gardner, who is obviously um, introduced the project, and second one is Roman Sebastiański, based in Gdańsk, who, whom you probably have seen on several of these events already. So uh, back to Jonas. Um, Jonas, can I ask you maybe just before I introduce the artist to comment on challenges of documenting uh, and obviously editing the, the footage uh, working yeah. virtually uh, back in Sweden for Govan with Love. Yes, okay. Hello everyone, great to see you. It was a really nice and warm and friendly time there in Govan. We had was such a great organizations and everything. But then we know everybody that this pandemic come. So it was a bit, uh, yeah, all the materials I got for the uh, footage and for my film, uh, yeah, ended up um, a bit more apocalyptic uh, after what happens maybe. So, uh, but I still have this great memory and we have so much thoughts about uh, me, for instance, I want to do a, an app and uh, a Dooms, Dooms Hill and it was so many things that I wanted to do but yeah now we all know what's happened so uh, but we have this remote artist uh, events that we're going to hear about so I'm very cur curious about because I'm going to plan to uh, make another edit and uh, go in part two for those events but we'll see it was a great adventure Okay, thank you, Jonas. Uh, so uh, now we're going to hear uh, from the pair of residences uh, from the artists of the of Water Project working locally with um, local community artists and groups in Govan in this very challenging uh, working conditions under which we are under with um, social distancing measures, but also in a very contested space, which Govan and uh, Graving Docks uh, itself are. So I would like to uh, introduce the first pairs of our, pair of artists um, and uh, community groups um, representatives to reflect on the key challenges and key outcomes of uh, the collaboration in relation to uh, Govan residences. And if relevant, could I also ask you to reflect not only on the social distancing, which obviously is very, very challenging in itself, and surely you have lots to share with us about the best practice, but in the same time about the kind of working in a contested spaces, uh, when you actually have to negotiate competing agendas and power dynamics operating uh, everywhere you turn. So um, without any further delays, I would like to invite first uh, Mary Conray from Ireland, together with Emma from Govan Stones, uh, to basically for three minutes uh, each to talk about the projects. On to you, Mary. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. I beg your pardon. I was just saying it's so lovely to see everybody again. It's been so long since we actually met in person. It's really beautiful to see everybody here and see everybody that we've worked with over this incredible project. And, you know, that it's, this is the, the slowly winding to an end. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about the projects that happen in Govan. So I put together some slides just to explain the project that I did, explain some of the process and the thinking behind what I did. Um, after our project in Govan. So I'm just going to show you a few images and a few slides, and then I'll talk you through the project. And then I'll hand it over to Emma to talk about it a little more. <clears throat> so I'm just going to share this screen. Can everybody see my screen right now? Yep, 
Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. Well, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what how it all started back in. It was over a year ago when we got there, and for me, the the introduction to Govan was pretty intense, and we met quite a lot of people. We met a lot of people in the week we were there. And for me, one of the things that really blew me away was the hard work that was being done on the ground, um, particularly by social enterprises, by community groups, the networks that had been um, created in Govan over the years and over time. And that's one thing that really stuck with me with the place was the contacts people had with each other and the trust they had in each other. And that community on a large scale, but broken down into smaller networks with social enterprises and community groups that always seem to come together and, and work together. I mean, I'm sure it's really not that romantic or simple, but at the time, for me, it really blew me away, this whole idea of third sector workers. I'd never heard that phrase before, but I really became quite interested in that and how people were working really hard to benefit their own local community and to raise funds for projects that they really believed in, raise funds for each other. And it became obvious that there was an obvious need for financial assistance in some in some parts of Govan. And what blew me away again was the people worked for this, worked really, really hard for this. So the people in Govan is really what struck me. And we we saw a lot of Govan, we saw a lot of the area. And one of the places that I was very drawn to was Govan uh, Old Church, which is here. It's one of the oldest churches in Scotland. It has this incredible history with these amazing Govan stones, which is where I met Emma. And these are hogback stones. So they come from a time in the uh, Viking period when the Vikings and the Celts kind of decided to live together in harmony. This Again, this is my romanticized artist version of the story. But it's one place where I could see the art from Vikings and the art from the Celtic times come together and create these monumental sculptures in the past. And there's a myster- mystery around them and a beauty to them that really, really drew me. And I'm always quite interested in in pre-industrial heritage. What was there before the shipyards? What what was lost when the industry came along? For example, Doomster Hill that Jonas mentioned there was a a sacred site possibly from the Bronze Age. And it's now covered in a car park. So for me, I think it's really important that Govan can see these stories, remember these stories and celebrate them in some way. So what I wish to do with my um, project was to kind of unite these two ideas that I had, which was the idea of the the social enterprises, the people, but also this history of Govan. And what I wanted to do was to provide a platform to promote the unique medieval and Viking history and also the culture of Govan while supporting a specific social enterprise by providing a product that can help raise finance for the benefit of and support of local community groups. So I had some conversations with Emma, who is working with the Govan Stones, about how how we might do this. So what I decided would be a good thing to do is to do some drawings of images around the church, around the graveyard, and use this artwork in a way to raise funds for the Govan Stones. The church itself is used by community groups as a meeting place. And for me, I think it's really important to try and use my skills as an artist to assist and help the community groups that I met there while promoting the culture of the area. So I made six drawings that I thought would make really nice postcards and we discussed with Emma what what we could use these drawings for. And I I created some very, very simple black and white drawings as you can see here, one was a map showing the River Clyde, showing the proximity of where Doomster Hill was to the River Clyde, to the stones, to the church, and really to give an idea of the history that was in Govan. I also really like these some of the gravestones are there, incredibly artistic, incredibly beautiful. The stonemasons and the Govan history of art and creation was always there. So I wanted to celebrate that as well. Uh, so this, so I began by doing my drawings. <clears throat> and with these drawings, I sent some of them back to Govan. And we made some prints using Glasgow Press. They're a letterpress company that we met when we were there. So they printed out these uh these really lovely A4 drawings so that we can use them as a product to sell as a, as a memento for people who visit the church. Um, so, it's a, so this will raise funds while also promoting that culture and the history and these beautiful, mysterious objects. So I got this parcel from Govan with Love, which I was so excited to get. I unpacked my prints, signed them, packaged them, and I sent them back to Govan with Love. At the same time, I decided it would be a wonderful idea to promote these images with some kind of guerrilla marketing. So 
what I did here was I made some life-size life size stencils of the hogback stone. So this is a two meter stencil of the hogback stone so that it could be created as a piece of public art and it could be placed outside to remind people or to invoke a curiosity about these incredible sculptures and this incredible history. And it would also be placed along Water Row, along by the river and uh, near Doomster Hill, which is that place I spoke of earlier that has been lost. The place of kings, the kingdom of Strathclyde has been completely lost. So what I wanted to do with this is to keep it in people's memory. Uh, so I sent over to Govan with Love my stencil pack and my prints. And we also thank, th this is when things started to get difficult. It was um, trying to get things organized with COVID restrictions, with businesses opening and closing. It was very difficult for um, Hamas and Inez to kind of keep the ball rolling on this. I don't know how they did it. I think they're miracle workers, you know, the amount of work that they managed to push forward and get through. So currently, um, they, they managed to install, we had to cancel memorial, we had to cancel some events, but they eventually managed to uh, work with the volunteers from Govan Stones, that's Bren, and some other local volunteers to install these two stencils um, down by the river. Um, and I think they look great. I think they did a fantastic job. So that's a piece of public art that has come from Ireland to Govan with Love. And also we have these products here. So we have, this is the final print as it's framed just in time for Christmas, everybody should have one in their house. These are tote bags that were also printed by a, a local um, company that were there, uh, printers there. So the idea was that any of the money that I received for my materials, I spent it locally and I spent it within social enterprises. I spent it um, with small businesses in Govan to really try and support as, m as much of Govan financially and individually as I could. So I kind of see these products as a way of using the materials money as a seed fund to help out the Govan Stones project, the old Govan Church, so that the legacy of this project will go into the future. I also sent the digital images to Emma and others at Govan Stones so that they could use them for whatever they want. So I'm hoping that my images will be appropriated by Govan Stones, by Emma, by her volunteers, and they will be used to promote the, the community that they have been sent to. And in a way, I suppose I have appropriated images from the past. I have appropriated images from the stonemasons of a thousand years ago. I've appropriated images from the stonemasons who made these incredible, incredible uh, gravestones. And I think I think it's just, a, it's, it's, it's a way of rejuvenating what happened in the past and the creativity that's always been in Govan. Um, and really, at this stage, that's as much as I can do with this project. So for me, I'm, I'm really interested to hear from Emma about what happened with these products, what happened with these artworks, how are the murals? Um, and so, yeah, so if, if you would like to speak about that, Emma, that would yeah. be amazing. If that's okay, we have time. Yeah, is that okay, Katarzyna? Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Right. Over to you, Emma. So can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, I think everyone who's ever met one of the Govanstones volunteers is going to be getting one of those tote bags for Christmas this year. So they're going down, going down a storm already. Um, I'd first of all like to say thanks on behalf of myself and the whole Govanstones team for the opportunity to be involved in the Memory of Water project. Um, while this strange pandemic year has been going, our small museum endeavour, which has been picking up momentum, community momentum over the past several years, it would have been really easy to, to hit a wall and lose momentum and lose volunteer enthusiasm. So the Memory of Water project and working with Mary was one of several sort of life rafts of positivity that came floating along, um, able to grasp onto it and use it as a vehicle for collaboration and building into the future um, and thinking about some big ideas that we'd like to put into to play. And I think the squad has made a, a lifelong friend in Mary. It's breaking news to Mary, but <laughs> brace yourself. <laughs> um, so the actual artworks themselves that you saw, the beautiful artworks produced by Mary, those have been used on the guerrilla marketing around, around the area of the church and also on the merchandise. But the whole squad absolutely loves these images. They were developed after some extensive chats with, with Mary, she was hugely receptive to hearing the stories that the volunteers and the community wanted to tell about Govan's medieval history. And so the images, when they arrived, we really felt 
sort of attached to them quite immediately. They came from our stories and they will be used not only in the merchandising, but they're going to be fully integrated into school workshops and craft activities for the older community. There'll be, Mary really took those things into consideration. She's given us images that we can use well into the future and that are able to be interpreted by people. Um, it's also given as a means to, while people can't come to the collection, the building has been closed. It's not particularly COVID safe. So we've been closed to the public this whole year, uh, which has been difficult. But the Memory of Water Project and Mary really encouraged us to think about ways to take the collection to the people um, rather than relying on people coming through our doors. So now we have these beautiful hogbacks all around the place. The volunteers have a space to stand and rabbit at people about the Kings of Strathclyde, which is always, always welcome. And it's accompanied lots of new routes like live video tours that we've been doing, activity packs and Zoom sessions for the community and things. These have all been happening at the same time as Memory of Water. So it's felt like a really positive way of expanding our message in sort of difficult times. So thank you, Mary, for being so receptive to, I think one of the conversations we put aside half an hour to chat about early medieval Strathclyde and we were there about two and a half hours later, still, still going strong with everyone's batteries running down on the laptop. Um, so it was quite, we had such a good time with the collaboration that it was almost easy to forget that there were going to be these physical outputs at the end, these artworks and this merchandise. Um, so when we saw what Mary had created, we were absolutely, absolutely thrilled and couldn't be happier to have been involved. So thank you very much. Thank you so much to Mary and Emma for sharing the collaboration. It's brilliant to hear about the good appropriation and the fundraising for the project and, you know, an education and outreach future of further appropriation. It's brilliant. Uh, Mary reflected on the community and generosity of collaboration with working with your volunteers. And I can just add to it from my own experience when we had the projects for uh, postgraduate students from Scottish universities and when we actually all always came to visit Govan Stones, I just was always taken by the generosity level of, uh, of people working in Govan Stones. So it's actually delighted to see, especially Christmas approaching. Emma, you should <laughs> share the link on the the mer merchandise and everybody <laughs> should be purchasing the objects as a Christmas <laughs> gift. Uh, and perhaps later on we can reflect on the key challenges, but thank you, delighted to hear uh, and this brilliant collaboration. Uh, without any further delay, can I ask now Tara Beal, who is American artist based in Scotland, on to, to share reflections and key challenges and outcomes on her um, personally delivered work in the challenging COVID uh, COVID um, social distancing measures in Govan in collaboration with community um, groups and uh, members from across Govan. On to you, Tara. Okay, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Great, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, just um, similar to Mary, I'm gonna share a few slides um, for about four minutes and then I've got just two minutes of video right at the end. Um, like um, other works that were part of this residency, this kind of govern residency, this piece was devised pre-COVID and then really reconceptualized and re revisioned like several times, I think probably everyone um, within this sort of new context. And my original desire was to create a happening or a community performance which pivoted around the history of Glasgow's steamies um, or wash houses. And this is something I've been interested in for quite a long time, but uh, haven't had the opportunity to focus on. The piece aligns with work, other work I've done in Govan um, over the past seven years through a project called Protests and Suffragettes. And it also aligns with, and hopefully echoes a little bit, um, the work that I did for Memory of Water in Lavadia in Greece called Let the River Take It, which was a community washing event, which was staged in the river Erkina, which is the river that runs through um, sort of as the spine of the town. And it involved the help and contributions of a tremendous number of local people who shared, shared stories. Um, they shared their memories and songs 
and a smaller number of people who helped me do some washing in the river itself. So to return to Govan and the sort of the history of the steamies really quickly. As I said, I was thinking about this history of wash houses and wash houses and baths in Glasgow, which are also referred to as pools, came, were built as a direct response to infectious diseases and an epidemics like cholera and tuberculosis over a hundred years ago. And they were built after the working class really demanded better housing conditions and better sanitation. Before these public baths were built, working class women would have been doing their laundry either in their flats in their, which you know in Glasgow are called tenements, their, their apartments, as we'd say in the States, um, or they would be doing their, their washing in the river. The first official wash house in Glasgow was opened in 1876 in London Road. And in the years that followed, there were about 20 that were built across Glasgow. There were two in Govan, um, one off Somerton Road and the other on Hart Hill Street. And they tended to be built as part of a larger swimming bath as, as a complex of, of baths, which is why they were often called the pools. And they were a really integral part of women's lives. So when the baths were shut down, which didn't happen until the 1980s. So you're talking about like a hundred years of, of history of this kind of women's working. Um, there were a lot of women who were really opposed to them closing. And this slide um, and the next is really just for me to, to remind myself to say that I became really obsessed with this, this idea of these, these mangles, which are also called ringers, um, which were part of the steamies and part of the sort of laundry process. And I could go on and on and on about like the, the mechanics of the steamies. They're beautiful and, and amazing, especially the ringers. Um, but we'll come to that um, just in a moment. The title of this piece is Through the Ringer. And as I was thinking about the steamies and those histories, but also as COVID kind of came into our lives in a new way, um, requiring a kind of sort of constant revisioning, <laughs> rethinking, um, which I did with the help of Inej and Hamish and great thanks to them um, and to, to Liz. But this question between the steamies and hygiene really began to foreground for me. And I just thought about how you know, we're washing everything all the time, aren't we? We're constantly, we've all learned to rewash our hands. It's all about hygiene and washing. Um, and I also started thinking about, you know, the way in which the steamies were considered a place, which I'll come to in a sec, of where, where communities gathered, um, where women gathered anyway, and how we, how we work as creatives and just as communities, how on earth do we do we continue to gather and to sustain ourselves? And how do we care for each other? How do we demonstrate care in a time where we can't touch, where we can't connect? So anyway, these are kind of the things that were, were coming into my head as I was, as I was sort of revisioning this piece. Um, in preparation for the work, I conducted 10 interviews um, and I transcribed them. Um, I, I transcribed these women's words onto cloth. Um, I interviewed women who had memories of washing and steamies in Govan, and I interviewed a large number of care workers, nurses, and full-time carers. And I watched, I asked them about exactly those things, about caring and washing and community and how, how the lockdown had been for them and how they thought about caring for each other and um, for their, their patients or their clients or their families in this time. So I took their words, excerpts of their words and transcribed them onto cloth. Um, there were two sections to the piece. The first was really about the steamies and about the memory of the steamies. And the second was really about care workers thinking about care. Um, so you'll see here, you know, quotes like I'm running behind all the time or it just feels like everything is taking longer or I do, I do find that a hard part of nursing the, the need to, to hurry all of the time because everything has to be done so quickly. In any case, so I took these words um, and transcribed them onto cloths. And then the staging of the piece really took advantage of the sort of natural amphitheaters, which are the back court of Glasgow's tenements. And the piece encouraged um, local residents to 
watch out of their windows or what in Glasgow is called windy hanging, which sounds better when someone with a Scottish accent says it, but you'll just have to suffer with me. Maybe, maybe Liz will say it for us after. Um, we also had some music. So in this way, it was similar to Lavadia. There was, a, there was some storytelling, there was some singing and there was some washing. We also had um, a neighbor who was classically trained and he um, sort of serenaded us out the window as well. As I said, the, the piece is called Through the Ringer. And that was really the structure was these cloths were hung. We had a very limited number of washers who came, took a cloth off the line, spoke out those words of the, of the women who were interviewed, um, washed the cloth. Then the cloth went to the ringer. Thank you, Inej, was one of our, our mangle handlers. Um, and then it was hung back up. Like I said, we had singing from Rosie, um, Rosie Kane and Tam McGarvey and also from a neighbor. And that's, that's it. So I'll just end, if that's okay, with just about a minute and a half of video. Is that okay? Okay, great. We're still good on time. Great. So this is literally a one minute excerpt from the day. So what you'll hear is Claire um, speaking out some of the words from the steamy interview. You had to book it. You had to go around and book the steamies. Sometimes it was once a week, sometimes it was twice. It depends how much washing you had. And then we would go. The atmosphere in it was absolutely brilliant. you could say you were looking forward to going down. I mean, you were doing your washing, you know, but you, you did look forward to it. That's exactly what you did. When I came out of the wash house, I felt as if I'd won the pools. All my washing was clean. And it was all mangled. It was just a great feeling. Okay, and do we have time for it's one minute of Claire speaking? Yeah, great. Yes, the, thank you. I was reading and speaking out the words. Oh, so sorry. I was reading and speaking out the words of people um, who had used the steamies in Glasgow um, and also um, the words of people who are involved in caring um, for people um, during the lockdown during these Covid times. It was really interesting because it's you know we were seeing those words um, and almost seeing them being washed away was quite interesting because um, but, but they're not really washed away because other people have heard them and now they're in the memories of those people so you know I find that quite really really great um, loved the singing from the window it was very emotional um, thinking about reunion and um, like almost sentimentality about this strange time which is it shouldn't be but there it is you know, I, I, I like that there were people at their windows that we could see, but there are, I imagine there are other people um, behind their curtains that we couldn't see. So hopefully we've reached more than, you know, what, what we could see um, experiencing it at the same time. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, right, I'll leave you. it there. Thank you, Tara. And it's really uh, very lovely to see the kind of main theme of generosity and community spirit coming through your residency as well and this idea of caring for each other and uh, uh, the commitments to care and you know the care workers and health workers and linking with the histories of govan and com complexity of these baths uh, which you and your obsession with mangles which which now makes me <laughs> obsessed with them as well because it brings the center memories as well really delightful so hopefully we can pick some questions uh, later on at the end. So without, I, uh, and I would like sorry, 
may I also just say, forgive me, um, because Helen has has joined us. So that was actually staged in Helen Kyle's back court. So perhaps later she can also speak about this. Apologies for interrupting. Yeah, that was really lovely, especially when she actually uh, reflects on sentimentality and obviously washed away words and then and the, but things staying with the memories and memories of water, one of the main themes of your project. It's a kind of brilliant summary almost of the of the whole project, which, which came to my mind. Uh, can you now, um, can we leave it there? And can I just now ask Ivona Zajons from Poland, uh, who worked together with Beatrice Serl, a freelance artist in Govan, to reflect on their residency and experience uh, with the focus on key challenges and key outcomes. So hear, hear them to them, please. Uh, hello, everyone. It's nice to see you and nice to hear you. Uh, I would like to share some photos uh, uh, from production and some movie also and uh, the, the main goal for me is to hear Beatrice's uh, opinion. Um, can we see the photo uh, from, uh, uh, from production from the uh, dry uh, Govan dogs? Is this, uh, is this ready because I can't see these photos? <laughs> my yeah. computer is confused in which <laughs> pictures to show, so let me just... Okay, uh, I can say I actually was born to, to, to make, born in Govan, uh, made in the shipyards. It is like uh, part of my identity. When I visited this place, I feel very, very comfortable and I really feel... I felt this place like, you know, my 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 home, part of my body. And I was so clear with my production, with my project. And I'm so happy that it was possible and it's happened. Um, I can say it was uh, uh, very difficult. I can imagine how it was difficult because of COVID. And um, I am very thank uh, everyone for this opportunity. Uh, especially, I want uh, to thank Beatrice Sell, uh, crew from Fable Vision, Liz Gardner, Ines Kevako, and Hamish uh, uh, Rhodes. And also, I will say special thanks to Jim Craig and Fairfield Heritage Center. Uh, I hope uh, Jim's idea with t shirts will be re realized. Um, it is great idea uh, about uh, because the quotes are so strong. Born in Govan, made the shipyards. This is even in Polish. Uh, when I heard this in Polish brain, this is so strong for me. And uh, uh, this made in ferry fields. It is like another part of the of the shipyards uh, in Govan. Um, this is also about something who you can be proud and I, I will uh, uh, Jim uh, will uh, prepare this t-shirts for Fairfield uh, um, Heritage Center and I hope so it's uh, it is happened you can see how strong it is yeah um, and now uh, I will show uh, a film uh, of the process because it's you know you can see Eugenia, uh, uh, she was uh, really, uh, um, she really supports my, my work and uh, you can see how we collaborate uh, in Gdańsk um, and after that it will be lovely to see, to listen Beatrice's uh, story. When I was visited uh, uh, Govan, uh, the, the huge uh, uh, inspiration I found in place where I used to was shipyard. This is because I uh, got studio for 16 years in Gdańsk in the shipyard and shipyard was really huge thema for my artwork and actually was really huge place in my heart uh, and, used, and still is. I visited uh, Firefield Heritage Center uh, in Govan and I listened to their uh, shipyard workers' opinion and it was really similar for shipyard workers' opinion from Gdańsk because I interviewed them in 2004. I asked uh, uh, people from the center uh, about, found for me some short quote 
quotes from these opinions and I choose one uh, which is uh, born in Govan, made in shipyard. I choose place for, for this text, uh, mm, uh, which uh, is really uh, interesting because this is dry docks and this is, uh, when you see this, it already look like some installation. But the problem, the, the main problem is, is the place is not uh, available for audience. You have to think about perspective and distance because people can see my installation from a bus station, which is a bow. This is uh, um, they, they they can read this text uh, when they are waiting for a bus. Uh, this is why I try to find some expert, and I choose uh, Eugenia Tinna workshop, and she uh, learn us uh, taught us uh, about uh, types. Uh, but th this which was really important for me was uh, when she told about uh, um, time. Uh, how time is connected with typefaces and it was important for me because I was thinking about the uh, 70s uh, in Govan where it mm, was in this place huge uh, um, movement, uh, shipyard workers movement uh, and they fight for their right. Uh, so Ivona invited me to this project to help her with, uh, um, with the letters and based on the materials we start to working on, on the letter shapes and actually it was more um, technical or like industrial uh, sans serif type or like grotesque. After that she drew it on the millimetric paper and then I focused on like developing it in the font editor. Eugenia told me about technique which called pounds pattern and uh, I collaborate with some artists from Govan, Beatrice. She used to work with uh, letters and stones. Uh, this is why uh, she told me for her this is normal technique and she knows this technique and I am happy because uh, uh, this is something emotional for me when she used her hands to paint it, uh, these letters on the wall. Her studio is not, not so far away from my installation and I feel this uh, circle and emotion around, like, you know, spirit uh, for this place. Uh, I think it is good spirit, I hope so. I was just thinking then, I think some of that good spirit that you mentioned, Ivona, was maybe consolidated by the fact that it rained so much and that me and Inez and Hamish were constantly battling with the weather and the paint running. Um, but I'm so honored, I think, is not an overstatement to have played a small part in being able to facilitate this work. And I, as you mentioned, I have a studio in Govan Unit 7, there's about 15 of us artists working in there. And I met the EU Memory of Water Artists last year. Um, and so when COVID hit and Hamish approached me about um, facilitating um, this work and getting Yvonne's letters onto the stone, it was really exciting because it's a big source of pride for me working in Govan. And um, I think working in proximity to somewhere like the dry docks, which is such a place of making and such an industrious place and um, has a memory of something really vibrant, is a bit contagious for all of the artists that work there. Um, and I think we'd all agree. So, uh, I mean, I suppose I could just talk about the technique that we used about pouncing a bit more, if that's interesting. Um, pouncing is an old sign writing technique that involves a scale drawing and then you perforate the paper or the card with a, um, a kind of rolling, a rolling spike. <laughs> um, you, you pin it or you fix it to your surface and then you use chalk to uh, compress the chalk through the holes. And that's what we did over a period of about um, four days on and off. Uh, and it's visible. I mean, it's, I, I cycle along that that bus route where the bus stop is that Ivona talks mm -hmm. about in her video um, and you can see even from the bus lane I can see on my bicycle that angle that she was hoping to achieve it says born in Govan made in shipyards um, 
And I think it was a genius move to do it on top of the graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> I think not my move, um, but definitely the right one. I think it looks as though it really is um, of and belonging to the place. And the thing that I am so thrilled about is that I feel that the words Nirvana chose have kind of named, very visibly named the thing and the process that went on there. And I think by naming it, and this is maybe something that uh, I'm interested in my work with words more generally, by naming it, she's celebrated it and validated it in a way that really can't be um, undone. So, yeah, that's my, that's what I wish to say, really. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to uh, Ivona and Beatrice for your reflections. And it's delighted to, to kind of hear how this project really adds to the community pride and really enhances this community pride, which is they're so strong. Like Ivona says, when you arrive in Govan, you know, you just feel it. You just feel it. You're just getting affected by it. Every time we're doing the project with students and, and walk along the, um, you know, the various places in Govan, one thing they always say in feedback is that the strength of the community spirit and the community pride in Govan and how delighted they are and inspired by that. So uh, obviously that type of work, it will definitely add uh, quite a lot to that. Can I just ask you both to reflect a little bit and maybe share with the audience for, for a couple of minutes and the challenges with working with the owner of the land and, uh, and you know, what subsequently came in, in, as a response to, uh, to your representation of the, of the community pride and then how the owner of the land would like to represent that um, subsequently. Uh, I have actually not too much information about this. I heard uh, only uh, yesterday, but Liz uh, knew more, much more about this. I was glad that he uh, he told yes, I can do it, on, because it was you know the key. Because he can say he can ref um, refuse. Uh, my uh, uh, my um, project, and I was happy. Then he he told yes. Uh, this is um, never. It's not never. It is easy when you talk about owners and developers. It is a specific uh, people uh, with property. As I can, uh, I have this experience in the Gdańsk shipyard. Uh, this is sometimes really strange and. Uh, a lot of fear and shame. I don't know why they, they they really play with something like this, and they, they they feel some fear because of art. I don't know why actually. Uh, and for me, it was amazing to trust. The, the first of all, I have to trust people, and uh, I was so. Um, I have this really good uh, feeling when I uh, when I uh, knew that uh, Beatrice is, will be working with my project because I visited her studio. She talked about her art, and you know I was really happy when Hamish and Ines told me that she will co collaborate with me. I was so peaceful with this and I was so touched when I saw photos. It is something amazing because I really feel the wall, the structure uh, together with them, the rain, the wind, everything. Yes, it's my experience and I'm so happy because, you know, I, I have these feelings that it will be connected with this place, but you never know. And I, when I saw how it together, and with this graffiti and with everything, I was so uh, honest and happy with this. Thank you. And Beatrice, would you like to add a couple of words to that? Um, the only thing that I was aware of practically about um, the site was our choice of paint was really important because it was a kind of um, necessary consideration that it would potentially have to be removed one day. Mm. and. Uh, I don't know that I kind of have a conclusion to this point, but it was interesting to consider uh, the idea of a kind of fixed or stagnant history, like um, like the docks hadn't cons hadn't um, continued accumulating a kind of history and a narrative 
of which Ivona's work was just a part, but we might actually have to kind of strip back that layer in order to get it back to something a bit supposedly purer or truer to what it what it was. Um, and that was in my mind quite a lot whilst we were making. The idea that it might not actually be very permanent. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, that's really interesting. The fine line between the the trust and negotiation with the owner of the land and the, and doing community work and contested spaces mm -hmm. like you all are guys working, but in the same time, what artists, uh, what what are you need to be mindful about this overlaying of histories and like Babs, as you mentioned, this archive, this living archive of memories and 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 fluctuating and changing over time and um, really exciting i'm just mindful about the time we probably will have time uh, at the end to reflect on all of the projects uh, with the audience but could i now uh, invite Sigrid wink from belgium who worked together with fiona fleming uh, the freelance artist in Glasgow, to reflect on their key challenges and outcomes of their residency so hello i'm Sigrid. Sigrid. <laughs> from uh, Ostend, Belgium. When I visited Govan last year for Memory of Water, I was really overwhelmed with inspiration because of all the beautiful places we visited and the people we met there, the rich history of Govan and the River Clyde area. So when I got back in Ostend, the hardest part was to choose one concept or idea to work with. I heard about Polish shipyard workers coming to Govan to build ships on the River Clyde and since Gdansk is also in the Memory of Water project, I wanted to do something with that part of the history to emphasize the connection between these two cities. I was planning to portrait a Polish shipyard worker as an homage or ode to their hard life's dangerous work. In the background, I would have painted a historical correct landscape of the River Clyde as a reminder of what once was so that's the image of the initial design. Due to the travel restrictions caused by the corona pandemic, I had to come up with an alternative mural for this place. After a lot of trial and error, I came up uh, with the light tugboat mural instead. Uh, so I created a manual that explained or illustrated step by step how to paint this mural. Also, there's a lot of symbolism uh, why I chose <coughs> tugboat. The tugboat's purpose by itself is also very beautiful because even the toughest or biggest ships need the help of the strong little tugboats to overcome the dangerous river. Metaphorically, they are like the lesser visible persons in society, but without them, things would rapidly, rapidly start going wrong or be impossible. A group of volunteers under supervision of Fiona Fleming made the mur mural possible and I assisted via live Zoom meetings and chat uh, messages to give tips and advice on the process and actions. This was a unique experience for the volunteers. It brought them together by letting them work and think together. And it strengthened their relationship. Teamwork was essential in order to produce this large scale mural in, in doing so, the similarities with the life of the shipyard, shipyard workers is evident. By letting the group use the technique of action painting, they were able to let off steam, something a lot of people weren't able to do the last couple of months in these strange times. I think the mural worked out so fantastic. It wasn't, I wasn't sure if it would work out because of the scale and me not being there to help them. But I think we found a fantastic, amazing way of long distance and COVID proof artistic intervention, which I think is pretty unique in the world. I haven't seen a creation like this anywhere, to be honest. So maybe now uh, Fiona can <coughs> give us some, uh, uh, a view on how she uh, uh, worked on the project. Okay, I mean, first of all, I mean, it was, um, can everyone hear? Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's, Siegfried had actually created a really um, accurate set of instructions. So, I mean, my, my take on it was, um, I am not interpreting anymore, I'm a safe pair of hands. 
So, I, you know, I, that's what I took it my duty to be as, as a safe pair of hands in the community and to, you know, just work with people and enable the Siegfried's design to go ahead. Um, so it's a very clear set of instructions uh, and a very potent image, actually. I mean, I, I personally love the idea of, like, the tugboat just being a, a very potent symbol for um, a, a smaller craft enabling large projects to go ahead. Um, you know, we're seeing all this just now with COVID, actually. It's the, you know, it's the shop workers. It's, it's all sorts of people in society that enable things to keep going. Um, you know, people, the, the small cogs, if you like, the tugboats. Um, so it was, it was a gift to work on, actually. It was really, really nice. Um, Inesh and Hamish and I, um, well, they, they'd managed to mooch some paint off a, a local company that donated paint. Um, had some sort of stray cans of paint about as well. So the, the thing that was quite nice is that, you, you know, you've got the controlled aspect of, you know, gridding up and, um, you know, using, using that kind of methodology and measuring. And then there's that sort of like this a wild aspect in between where there's the action painting. We're all going a bit Jackson Pollock and a bit crazy and throwing things around. And then obviously there's that thing where you're, you're polishing it again, you're, you're restraining it all with a nice solid line and um, the thing that was interesting as well it's that thing about negotiating with people you know obviously Neil owns the building like the big shed you know and he was a bit sort of like oh you know it's like it's slightly skeptical but you know we'll wait and see see what happens kind of thing um, and he seemed quite won over which was which was really good and I think he really liked the tugboat in the end he was concerned that if we created a big dark area it would be like a beautiful canvas for graffiti um, and that he would have to repair it again. In my mind, actually, if it acquires graffiti, I don't think it'll actually ruin the look of the profile of the tugboat or anything like that. I think it's, um, I think it's very strong and very punchy in and of itself. Um, it was lovely working with the volunteers as well, actually. So we, you know, we had Rory and Rachel and Stephanie, and um, you know, obviously Inesh and Hamish were like grafting away. Uh, we had Lou Taylor as well, actually. So Lou was really, really helpful uh, for a couple of days as well. So, um, yeah, we got there in the end. Um, but it was challenging conditions, I guess, actually, creating a, you know, creating a mural work outside in November on ladders and stuff. But um, it's, it's actually very enjoyable, actually. Sometimes it's like you know, the, the more of a physical challenge and the more messy and awkward it is, um, it's quite satisfying seeing it resolve in the end. So... Okay, thank you so much to Secret and Fiona. And it's obviously uh, another good example to, uh, of your project to, po to put forward uh, for a Govan Gdańsk shipyard twinning. You know, we, we have this uh, idea for, for many years now, but obviously, you know, this project adds to that as well, uh, you know, linking shipyard uh, workers from Gdansk and from Govan uh, uh, through this work. And it's wonderful to hear uh, from Fiona about, the, again, the, the volunteers and people working together, community spirit, despite ever, ever, um, you know, never stopping rain in Govan. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned Jackson Pollock, because I was wondering about those washers, but yes, that's, <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> He would like it himself as well. Uh, thank you so much for, for your contributions. Um, can I just now ask uh, the last uh, pair of um, artists to share their project, which is Ira Brami from Greece and Helen Kyle, um, who will work together with artists from Stage in Govan to realize uh, the project. So on to you both. Is Ira there? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, so first I would like to... Uh, I feel so honored uh, working with Helen Kyle, and I want to thank her. And also with uh, I want to thank Hemis Ines for helping and States of, of Scotland. Uh, I would like to say a little bit about my first idea uh, that I have uh, when I first visit Govan. Uh, my first idea was to uh, bring uh, Clyde River uh, back to life. 
by Havlek boat parade into the river um, with uh, Scottish music, with uh, storytelling, myths, and like celebrating the reawakening of the river. And uh, because uh, I, I was very surprised how beautiful is the river, but at the same time empty with no people around. So um, my main idea I, it was this, to bring again people uh, to Clyde River and create new memories for uh, the people and from the for the place. Uh, uh, then, uh, because we couldn't travel because of COVID, uh, Helen and Kyle uh, decided to organize uh, this uh, 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 parade. But uh, again, because of COVID, uh, we are more isolated and we couldn't do. So we both decided to create uh, films. Uh, so I de uh, decided to create a film uh, from my reflection from the Govan. And uh, also, Helen, uh, what was the idea to make it a film? Uh, so I created uh, a film, but unfortunately we have problem with editor uh, because the office that we do, the editor is closed because of COVID. So we hope soon to have the uh, film. Uh, so the film has uh, uh, two, three things inside is uh, one uh, uh, the industrial life then is the nature and some footage from the govern that uh, I asked so um, uh, and the main uh, point of the film is the folklore and the traditions and um, uh, my research focused uh, what is the problem of folklore now nowadays and the traditions uh, so before I create the film, uh, I write a text that uh, I would like to read you uh, so you can understand a little bit my main aspects about the film. Uh, so, and this text uh, was my guide of my creation. So I wrote this text uh, because I found many similarities from uh, govern life and in Athens I try to find these similarities and transfer them into the image. Uh, so now I will read the, the text. Uh, walking, walking along the river with, uh, the, in the Clyde River in Govan, I felt empty. I look around the empty industrial buildings and the wild beauty river whose the only living element was the water. I met a man on the river bank and told me that the Kelpies once lived in this river. That was a Celtic myth, a part of Scottish folklore. According to which there was a, a water spirit that born from seaward and a horse. I felt uh, uh, identified with Kelpies, exper experiencing the decline of my existence due to the industrial way of life. Uh, then visiting Levadia, yeah. I heard the myth about Pegasus, who is also a mythical horse. Uh, uh, the myths say that uh, there was a song contest and the daughters of King Pieros competed with the muses of Eliconas Mountain. As soon as the daughters of King Pieros came out, everything got dark. The sun hid behind the clouds. But when the muses came up, the sun appeared and everything lit up again. Everyone so excited and so was the mountain Eliconas, which was enchanted and began to, be began to rise to the sky. Seeing the mountain up there, Posidonas got anxious that people will be able to learn their secret. And he said his, his son, uh, the horse Pegasus, which was a winged horse, to hit with his hove the mountain and sent it back to the earth. At the point where the horse hit in, a source was created, which is called the source of Hippocrines. Uh, the source of Hippocrines uh, used to be in the ancient times, um, the source that the artists uh, drinking water from there get inspired. 
So we see that myths around the world have uh, many similarities and great things to teach us about humanity, and they can be great tools for building a better future. Um, but now, as a human being, we have virtually abandoned the womb that had created them, create us, um, and we are living in a terribly hostile university. The love for the past and the gloomy interest in, in every kind of exotism has temporarily stopped our brain function. The decline of modern world had left men mentally dead. People forgot their mother, the mother, along with her children, um, and they have been enslaved by time and money. And I'm wondering, are we are still human beings and that corpse of our will not bloom again? Uh, so that was my text that uh, I created the film. So that's for me. Um, we can opinion. ask uh, Helen uh, and the stage uh, to perhaps say a few words about the collaboration, please. Hi, how are you? So um, basically, I was very interested in the ideas that Ira came up with in relation to if we were able to have done what she had envisaged, you know, outside. However, as she's explained, more and more, it became more and more isolated. So rather than just let the project go, Stage and its artists came up with the idea of doing a mural of the River Clyde or part of the River Clyde that takes in Govan and to get other people to make paper boats and pin the paper boats onto that mural. Then we got involved with some artists that we'd never worked with before. And the way we got involved was that one of the good things about COVID, in a sense, is that people, because they were off work, actually spent more time in the back, their back doors, either doing their gardens or whatever. And I was able to speak to quite a, a lot of them, you know, from the buildings that I live in. As Tara said, her project took place in the back door where I live. And that's how we discovered Chris, the opera singer, because he was out doing his garden. Um, so we came up with this idea. And while I was speaking, we found out that we had an actress we had three musicians, we had two technicians, all living in this small area that's known as Paisley Road West. Um, so when I had come up with the idea, I thought it'd be nice for us to actually introduce the whole concept of the river from when it was really, really busy as a shipbuilding industry into what, what it has become, which is the quietest river in the world in a sense. So basically, um, I did some research and I found out that the River Clyde actually had a goddess. Did anybody know that the River Clyde had a goddess? <laughs> well, we do. It, and she's called Clota. So I thought it'd be very, very nice to bring all of the people that I know that work with uh, the community in the area and also who are artists in their own right. Um, I got a writer to write the story from the goddess's point of view of what the Clyde was and is and could be in the future. Um, and we made a 10 minute film, hopefully that will introduce what Ira has actually come up with in relation to the film that she has made in Greece. So we've had a really great time. It's been very, very interesting. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Helen uh, and Ira, for sharing the ideas of your collaboration. Um, um, and thank you to all of you for, for your contribution so far to summarizing the project and sharing with audience the key challenges and key outcomes. We have about uh, um, just under 20 minutes, and I would like now to open this to the uh, uh, question and answer session and to the discussion. We already have some questions from the Facebook uh, um, 
And can I just maybe start with the question related to pre-industrial histories? So which will be questions for Mary and Emma, Tara, and also to Ira and Helen, linking with your focus on folklore and mythology. So the question is, in seeking pre-industrial histories, what challenges did you come across? Govan Boats Building is quite a dominant part of the historical narrative and historical imagination. So can you all, all of you, can you please reflect on how do you think your practice helped the process of seeking that which is less discussed? And can you pl please share with your experiences in relation to that work? Could, could I answer that first? Because I'm going to have to go quite soon, okay? Basically, yes, my, my, basically my background is in community development. And uh, I've been very, very much involved in the politics, if you like, of what happens to the shipbuilding industries as it became quite difficult. The sad thing for us, from a government point of view, well, I can just speak for myself, is that all we build now is warships. That isn't a very good reflection of what the people of Govan, although it gives some work. But there's only 89 people actually from Govan work in the shipyards. So technically, the shipbuilding industry within the Govan framework is not, as magnet, is, is not actually functioning as well as it could. The other thing I want to uh, raise is that it's all very well for people like us, like artists, like uh, people who believe that actually there is a soul in people, you know, that reflects who we are. And that cultural soul, if you like, we are born with it. And whatever country you come from, you'll be influenced by that learning, that teaching, those stories. But the reality is to act, you're usually put into... Uh, a scenario, if you're working in an area that actually has a reputation of having deprivation, then people out with the area do never think that there's any uh, artists or culture or, or anything. They think something totally different. And also, I think it's time for people who are interested in culture and the arts to start looking at working at a grassroots level to change that attitude because sometimes you get people from the top down who kind of patronise us in relation to patting you in the head, in relation to what have you got to offer? Well, actually, we have hundreds to offer and they're missing out. And it's about time we challenge that. Thank you so much. That's really, really good, uh, good summary in terms of the contribution to the local community and the local pride uh, of what your project uh, have achieved. Uh, could I ask maybe uh, Mary and Emma, as well as Tara Bill, to perhaps uh, join in in answering these questions about looking at the pre-industrial pre histories or histories which are not necessarily linked with shipbuilding in Gov. So we found that the Govan stones that if you were to anywhere in Glasgow, sort of stop a hundred people in the street and ask have you heard of the Govan Stones or have you heard of the Kingdom of Strathclyde? You're not going to get that many um, positive responses. It's not really something that we teach in the Scottish education curriculum, this pre-Scottish history. But if that's what you're looking for, then there's no place richer than Govan for, for that history. So there's a bit of a gap in being able to communicate that pre, 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 pre-industrial <laughs> <laughs> history um, and this project especially Mary's enthusiasm about it and translating some of those considerations into her art as well. So can I just ask you Emma that we have a very strong policy implication of the project here and you need to really have been in conversation with Ministry of Education because I certainly want my son who is seven years old to learn all about that in, in his curriculum and it's not too late so I think there is conversation to have <laughs> as soon as possible uh, uh, to perhaps revisit the, the Scottish curriculum uh, and especially Scottish history focus and uh, brilliant and I really think definitely it's a mileage to do there. Well you'd certainly have some support behind you from <laughs> from Govan Old with, with that agenda, definitely. Thank you. And uh, and Tara, would you like perhaps to add to that uh, to that dis discussion on the uncovering this 
Meanwhile, his stories, please. Sure, Mar Mary, do you want to go first or? Um, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm just, well, I think Emma is the expert to speak about with this. That's that's why I don't really have much to say. I mean, for me, I just think it's insane that this is not better known, you know, for, for, for towns like that have this history on their doorstep, that it's, it's, it's actually hidden, it's covered, it's physically covered. And uh, for me, a lot of my work is about environmentalism. So I try and find why these towns became there became towns in the first place and it, it it stems from the Clyde, it stems from that crossing place, it stems from that rich history of land and culture that was acquired there millennia ago and it, it's it's still part of that soul that Helen was talking about and that's what needs to be brought out and drawn out and celebrated. So sorry Tara. People. No, no, please. Um, I think, so I'm, I'm just wanting to make sure, I think the question is about pre-industrial histories, so um, I would say that a lot of the work that I've done in Govan over the last, you know, whatever, seven years, decade, um, has been really focused on we on on recovering um, underknown stories. So women's histories, the histories of Scottish traveling show people, um, other, you know, and that these histories are are always interwoven within the sort of the, the more dominant historical narratives of shipbuilding and heavy industries, right? But so the, the, I think the, and I've just employed a lot of different strategies over the year to try to like kind of break that open a bit and try to trouble it or unpack it, or also to find, I mean, I think this is the thing that is maybe potentially useful within creative practice um, or can be is to find um, sort of, ways to sort of weave those threads back into the dominant narrative you know so in other words how do we get women's histories to just be histories you know to just be part of the histories that we are learning so i think that's you know that's and and the work that i've done with protests and suffragettes and the piece um you know through the ringer was really you know in helen's back court is really about that it's really about how do we make visible these these really um this these this work that is often invisible. Um, and the other thing I'd like to do is just underline what Helen said. I think um, everything she said, I would, I would just, you know, reiterate and stand behind and amplify. So I think, I think that creative practice and the art world, the contemporary art world really needs to um, look hard at the way in which it considers, conceptualizes and frames what, what, what is often referred to as community arts, you know, and the kind of, you know, distinction or the, you know, yeah, the hierarchy um, within contemporary art where things that are involved with, with and within communities are, are auto, almost automatically considered to be, um, you know, slightly less than or slightly more problematic. I think that's. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. Uh, so obviously the one big policy implication we have already is linking with the with the education but I think uh, education in the classroom but also education through the cultural institutions yes the the galleries museum and cultural institutions where where all these meanwhile narratives and meanwhile histories needs to become more visible and be intertwined in a dialogue together with that uh, main narrative which which floats on the surface uh, which is obviously not 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 less important but but is is as important thank you so much for your reflection we have another questions uh, uh, about the um, about the so working in a context of covid so would it be possible for artists to create these beautiful artworks without visiting govan for residency do you need to see and feel places to invest the hearts in the art projects you you all kind of slightly uh, already reflected on the idea of how you being you because you most of you have been in in govan previously and how much uh, the, the place have have affected you but perhaps could you all all the residences uh, reflect on these questions about uh, working in a context of covid uh, and um, and you know, like the importance of visiting the place to 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 realize the project. Who would like to start? Oh, I mean, could I could I just say something? Obviously, um, what I was doing was interpreting Siegfried's design, um, so it had a very accurate set of instructions and a way to go about it. So a very very clear roadmap, if you like, from Siegfried. Um, but obviously, there was a sensitivity in his part and understanding of the place. 
So although he was giving these instructions remotely, he had obviously invested a lot of time and thinking in what he was going to do. So um, I, th I think that, that thing about actually visiting and feeling the spirit of a place is, is still quite important. Um, although obviously he, he then kind of succeeded in com communicating remotely and um, as, as doing that as a team and me trying to, as faithfully as possible, reproduce what I feel he would have done. Um, obviously, within, within any artwork, you, you create a bit of wiggle space, so you create planning, but you, you want to be able to react on the ground. So it, it's just get, so I mean, what I would say is, um, I feel like Siegfried um, did that distance thing very, very well and communicating with us and supporting us. Um, so yeah, so that, that, that was actually a really good experience. And But again, I think he had the experience of, um, I guess, having having really sort of d done his groundwork. So I think that's why it was sensitively realized, you know, so. Thank you, Fiona. Yeah. Do you, do you other ones of you who would like to perhaps add to this point a little bit about the feeling places and working remotely, please? Yeah, I, I will answer um, that question and say, no, I, I really don't think it would be possible to, to do this work without having visited a place. Um, uh, I think, as anybody knows, I, I don't know how you can get so much information via conversations, even online, even doing research with all the, the miracle that is the Internet. You still will not be able to smell the sea air or touch the trees or walk in the grass or just be present in those groups of people that we were present in and see the dynamics of the social interactions between people or even just to stand on the side of the street and watch watch the people go by see the buildings it's impossible it's just there there is no way it's possible to produce something like this or to work like this without actually visiting a place to see the people and it's all those little things that you see out of the corner of your eye or something that you might see in passing that all feed into the depth of these projects i just i i, I don't think i think if we, you know there's no other way you can research this by being other than by being present, because any other information you're getting is going to be secondhand. It's going to be filtered through somebody else's memory, filtered through somebody else's documentation. Photographs will be through somebody else's eyes. It's you, you cannot have an authentic experience and produce authentic artworks without being present and in, in a space, in a place and spending time there. That, I, I think that's a definite no to that question. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm just mindful about the time. I think it's really amazing how all of you have managed and succeeded, uh, especially what, what is really very powerful is to actually reflect on the, on the collaboration and co-production of your works. I mean, the, the, the kind of genuine, genuine aspect of co-production in this residency is so powerful. And uh, how, how Hilt the brand actually is putting that in the comments in her uh, in Facebook is how amazing how COVID didn't succeed in putting down artistic creativity on the contrary. So this is where I would like to finish this first session be before I pass into Liz. Well done and congratulations. Absolutely delighted with how much guys you have achieved and um, well done for uh, good appropriations. So now I would like to pass to Liz uh, to perhaps uh, summarize and introduce the session which is happening this afternoon. Thanks very much indeed, Katarzyna, and thanks to everybody who has contributed to this really rich and powerful session. It's moving to hear the, the results of what could have been um, something very watered down. Uh, what has happened has been huge, um, and I think uh, everybody who's been involved needs to be very, very proud of it. Um, so thanks very much for contributing to this evaluation session. We've really got it. I mean, I, I think this is the first time we've actually had the chance to, to share with each other, even, never mind uh, the rest of the world. And, and we've really got it. We've got it for ourselves um, as well as, as for everybody else. So we're now going to have a, a, a short break, um, 30 minutes time to have a coffee, uh, a comfort break. And uh, we're going to resume um, at one o'clock um, with a, a, a focused uh, discussion on the graving docks itself. That session is going to be chaired by uh, Professor Graham Jeffrey from the University of the West of Scotland. Um, and it's 
going to involve um, contributions from uh, Dr. Lorraine Leeson uh, from Middlesex University in London. Uh, she'll be sharing her experiences around London's Docklands. And Dr. Stephen Pritchard, who's a, a freelance practicing artist, activist and academic. Um, so 30 minutes, um, have a nice coffee and we'll see you then. Thank you, everyone. Liz, I'm not going to be able to stay. Is that okay? It's absolutely fine, Helen. No. Thank you so much for being here. Right, okay. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Lovely to see yeah. you all. Bye. You. Bye, Bye, Helen.